I'm not going to mention the event, the location, or the attendees, but they ran things, they made stuff happen in the libraries and archives space. The hosts brought me in because I was, and am, a troublemaker. And it was thought that they'd normally had these kind of meetings, and they were sometimes a little bit boring, prosaic. Let's bring in somebody to drop a bomb at the beginning. And I was told specifically, cut back on the profanity, but go hard on the, on the weird. And I did. I talked about what drove me as an archivist. I told them about where I really thought we were doing things at the archive and, and where I thought we'd get better at it and where I thought we could do better and just talked about the nature and, and, and the experience of gathering so many things in one place and uh, kind of finished up with thoughts about where we were headed and, and what to do. And it was all meant to be fun, rousting, weird the kind of speech I really do love giving. And at the end, I opened it up to questions. And the questions, in some cases, were not questions. But there was one question that was not a question that still sticks with me a month later. Her question, which was not a question, was, I have made it my life's work to be educated in archives and gaining degrees and expertise, and it offends me to the core that someone like you would call yourself an archivist. You are not an archivist. You are a rank amateur. This is Jason Scott. You're listening to the Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It podcast, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Brenda Romero, Jeff Atwood, Daniel Boyd, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and other places who have been helping me get out of debt. So, yeah, the room was a little quiet after this question, not question. But I was pretty prepared for it because this wasn't the first time that somebody who had a professional grade level in archiving was offended that I would call myself even a free-range archivist. It was the idea that it was almost malpractice to lead people on, that I was in some way educated as to the specific procedures and formalizations of the archiving discipline. It was like fraud. This fraudulent face that I was putting forward to people uh, represented a slap to those who had spent years and decades building up careers as archivists and being dependable and aware and knowledgeable in what had come before and what was known to be. Now, if you're listening to this, you're probably of two minds. One of them is to rush to my defense. I assure you, please don't worry about my mental sanctity or my ability to think of my own self-image. I'm quite set there. Ego is not a problem with me. It's something that needs to be tamped down. It's not going to be uh, deflated and destroyed and cause me to run with my tail between my legs and my head held low. I'm going to be fine. Uh, there were people afterwards who came up to me and said, you are an archivist, and, and I know I'm an archivist. But there's another group who says, you know, she kind of had a point. Here are people who are trained with all of this knowledge, terminology, and awareness of what had come before, and you just kind of show up in your big, dumb top hat and your crazy outfits and your weird, profane-filled tweets, and you act like you can stand among these people. And the concept of the rank amateur... I. I like to research what people are referring to when they use a term that's kind of flown by, and rank amateur is absolutely one of those. It goes back a long way, and it implies that you never actually entered into a formal agreement or environment to prove the skills you have are in any way comparable to the professional guilds and organizations. I am going to be the first to tell you, they're right. My education 
is in mass communications with a concentration in film at Emerson College, uh, class of 1992. Classmates of mine at the time were one of the Wachowskis, who dropped out after a year, Paul Thomas Anderson, who dropped out after a year, Bill Burr, who was on the West Coast campus, so I didn't really interact with him, and a number of other people who have gone on to, frankly, wonderful careers, uh, working on places like The Daily Show, Colbert, Samantha Bee, sports shows, stand-up comedy, and, yes, filmmaking. I've made a few films myself. Others have become editors and producers and directors, and absolutely, we're living the mass communications life. But Emerson College did not have a library science degree. It barely had a computer lab. What it had was radio, television, newspapers, comedy groups, and performing arts. And I threw myself headfirst into all of these things. I performed on stage. I worked in production. I made little films. I was in a comedy group and did basically animation for them. I did comedy writing. I did newspaper writing. I did editorial cartoons. I took a lot of time off to go to all parts of Boston and walk around and experience things, kind of eschewing the academic parts. I got six Ds at Emerson College. I graduated with a 2.1 grade point average. If that's not a system you're aware of, I assure you, I was one or two classes away from not quite making it. I had to take classes the summer after my, quote, graduation to actually qualify for my degree. The summer class was history of jazz, by the way, and I got an A. The skill set that I had built in bulletin boards leading up to college was where I learned how to sort through information and put it up on directories on my BBS and present what I learned to others in a cohesive way. I loved the writings of Dave Barry and tried to emulate him with my own humor column in high school and later writing in college. I loved humor and public speaking and performing, and I really wanted to make films. And so when I went to Emerson, it was to learn how to be a filmmaker. And what I also became was even more of a storyteller. And when I graduated, I had, like I said, a terrible academic degree, but a love of expressing myself, bringing attention to things, and, of course, the ever-present ability to sort through massive amounts of information. Internet access was something that I snuck onto in my college years and which continued after I graduated. And this ability to work in something called HTML and bring out full color productions, this was like the greatest gift to me at the time. I was in my early 20s. I, I wanted to go to every website. I wanted to learn what everything was about. You know, these gray background web pages held so many insights into little communities like the geek houses of, of Santa Cruz or, or fantastical muds that existed all over the world. These little insights into where the world was heading on this growing internet, uh, I never looked back. And with the web and with HTML comes more files to download, more systems to understand, more organization, more getting involved in declaring this to be this and that to be that. And, and, and basically, when I got to 1998 and created textfiles.com, my whole life had led up to that. Textfiles.com was a production. It was a presentation of a world that I thought was gone and was never going to come back and had lost itself into the loam of the networked world. It was a world where we connected to things one at a time and interacted through small amounts of text. And I had gathered 
thousands of these examples of text and put them up in a way that I thought would be attractive and cinematic. I had a black background and green text and, and described all of these crazy little text files with one-line descriptions meant to pull you in. It was, I felt, a library. A library of information, a library of programs, a library of art and, and sound. And as the hits grew, as thousands and then tens of thousands and now millions of people have visited textfiles.com, I started calling myself a librarian, a person who had assembled a, a pile of interesting things put them together in a system that I'd hoped was pretty understandable, and then made it available to everyone to read any time. But again, through all of this, I was, unquestionably, a rank amateur. I was feeling my way through, bouncing around, trying something, pulling it down. I wasn't reading up to see what sort of nomenclature and domain-specific numbering should be used and what references and cross-references should be used. I didn't do any of that. I just put it all together. I just did my best with what I had done before. You know, when I had run the works BBS in the 1980s, it also had text files. It had lots and lots of them brought in from all around the country and uploaded from other users. And I did my best to assemble things into directories. And, and, and this was something that I just felt I could do just kind of on my own. You see, I don't know if it really hurts to have a low stakes, simple effort project that does something that you think the world needs. I don't really think in terms of zero sum games. If you've not heard the term zero sum before, and I use it all the time now, it's the idea that something that you're doing represents a finite number of resources. So if you spend five minutes doing project A, that is five minutes taken away from project B, C, and D. You might have $50,000 to do work. And if you choose to spend $5,000 having a party uh, to celebrate the spending of the other 45000 well, somebody will say you're playing a very bad, very bad zero-sum game. This is a philosophical outlook that I've just always had problems buying into. Maybe that $5,000 party attracts so many people that they want to donate even more than $50,000 to the project. Maybe working on Project A causes people to realize that projects B, C, and D are equally important and resources that weren't there before will move towards it because otherwise they had no advocate shining light on them. When the Internet Archive chose to start putting together websites into WARC records, uh, web archive records in the 1990s and assembling them in such a way that they could be, quote unquote, played back. Not everything was in stone. Not everything was done right, but it was done. And uh, for better or for worse, these are the records that exist now that are the easiest to get to that play the most vital role in both research and in involving people being able to figure out what the web was like. They stand, in many cases, alone. I just, I spend so much time reaching out to people who created projects without having any formalized education in them, who learn through trial and error or talking with friends or just dreaming it up whole cloth and trying it once and failing and trying again and failing and, and maybe on the fifth and sixth try, get it right using the lessons they taught themselves. I love collaboration. I love working with others. Uh, archive team is a collaboration to the nth degree. Even a project like one of my documentaries has me as a prime mover, perhaps, but there's hundreds of people who played a part in making it what it is. Again, I'm not looking to beat up on this person, but it struck me how much venom was in what she said to me. There was a sense that I didn't belong, that I shouldn't be there, that it was actually an insult 
that I called myself what I called myself, that I acted like I did, that I thought I could stand in front of others and tell them ideas or what I think should be done. And I was quite happy to stand there. I was quite happy to talk to them. Obviously, I don't agree. And maybe the reason I'm bringing this out is a little bit of therapy, but it's also for people who are out there, who are listening to this, who want to go into a field of study, one that they don't have a degree of, one that they maybe can't show some sort of certification for, and who are in many ways perhaps feeling outsider or not qualified. And while I realize there are issues of safety, of carefulness, and certainly danger in some fields, but... I just want to say that the same urge to leap into a field and into a project without having a bunch of formalized education to back you up or a bunch of carefully cultivated set of qualifications and certificates, the fact that you would still journey in there tells me that you have the passion, the drive, and the will to succeed. I believe in you. I'm not insulted by you. And you are a rank amateur. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to James Bekoyanu, Sam Johnston, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and other platforms, including PayPal, LibrePay, and just bothering me in the street, uh, for helping me get out of debt. Besides the bill paying, I'm now putting some amount of money aside for the taxes I'm going to have to pay for last year, and also paying off my accountant for the work that he did this year. Having those reserves is the difference between sliding into the end of a month and hitting myself with lots of penalties from my bank, and just being safe and careful, and being able to recover when the inevitable surprises pop up. I'm still enjoying this podcast very much. This podcast is still a lot of fun. Feel free to tell people to check it out at podcast.textfiles.com.